Direct from the Broski Nation headquarters in Los Angeles, California, this is the Broski Report with your host, Brittany Broski. Hey guys, welcome back to the Broski Report, starring me, your host, Brittany Broski. I am the host, and you're not. But we could come to some form of a contract or arrangement wherein you give me all of your earthly possessions and I let you talk into this microphone for three minutes. Now, of course, you will be censored and your voice will be modulated uh, much lower than what it is. So you will not be recognizable. We will not show your face and uh, you can't say really anything of substance. And after all that, I own everything that you've ever owned. And also, if you have a boyfriend, I get to keep him. So think about it carefully. Let me know. Uh, please get back to me by end of day, you know, sort of thing. Like, just let me know what you're thinking. Oh my God, they're still kissing. My Kylo Ren and my Mando. Guys, quit. We're live. <laughs> Seriously, stop. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to talk today about a few different things. But to begin, I want to talk today about my old favorite books. Because since we've come into this new you know, it's almost a renaissance, a renaissance, if you will, of adult fantasy novels like Court of Thorns and Roses, whatever, like that kind of sparked this. And I still need to read Fourth Wing. It's sold out everywhere and I don't want to order it on Amazon. I want to like go into a bookstore and buy it. It's this new like wave of people are loving it. It's Game of Thrones for the girlies, even though Game of Thrones is for Game of Thrones for everyone. It's like so it has us by a chokehold. And so it. I've been thinking a lot about what did I used to read, you know, in high school or in college or even in middle school. Middle school was a big, like heavy reading thing for me. Like that was when Twilight happened. That was when Hunger Games happened. Uh, I think junior year of high school was when uh, the sort of John Green moment happened for me when I read Fault in Our Stars. And I was like, I've never experienced this many emotions in the span of three days. Like that was kind of my first emotional whiplash of, oh my God, how am I attached to these people? And they're not real. John Green, I cannot believe that that's the same John Green that is John Green. So by the way, crazy to think about. That's like, he taught me European history and he made me cry with uh, Augustus and whatever her name was. Okay, so I want to talk about the books that I obsessed over in Middle school first and then high school because I know I will find community with some of y'all. Some of y'all I will find community with here. And if not, go read these books. It's a great time. <clears throat> also, if you're looking to be inspired to start reading again, just go to the bookstore and physically buy a book. When was the last time y'all were in a bookstore? And if you're on Book Talk, like, don't answer that. But for the girls and people that don't read, when was the last time you stepped into a Barnes and Noble and got a little coffee and a donut and walked around and shit your pants in the bathroom there? When was the last time you did that? Go do that this weekend. It's a blast. And the people that work at bookstores are so, ask them any question. They are some of the smartest people. Like it, it, they have opinions on every book. They have opinions on film, TV. Like they're just so cultured because, you know, working at a bookstore, like to want to work there, you have to kind of know what's going on to get recommendations and so on and so forth. Sorry, let me just move my big, big ass water bottle, ass water bottle, ass water. So in middle school, the book I was absolutely obsessed with other than Twilight, of course, Twilight, I could do a whole different episode on Twilight and Twilight's impact on my psyche as a young, impressionable, uh, goopy brained middle schooler. I digress. The book that had me by a chokehold dude was City of Bones, the Mortal Instrument series. <sighs> Jamie Campbell Bower played Jace in the movie adaptation. And the movie was so bad and it flopped so fucking hard that they did not make a second one. And it's one of my like guilty plays. You know how people watched Emily in Paris, people, and it like, it's so bad, but famously it kept getting renewed because people were like, this is so bad. When's the next season? Or what's that other one? Kissing Booth. Like these are objectively bad shows, but I'm going to watch it. And I'm invested. That's how this kind of came about. Like they just kind of did a bad job with the, 
they just didn't make it cool. Like, it reading the books, I remember it was so cool. Now, I was also, what, 13, 14? And I, I got lost in this world of, they are called shadow hunters, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. And uh, those little, these little symbols all over him are called runes. And you would draw them with like a, like a stupid, like a sonic screwdriver, like Dr. <laughs> and I don't know if they're, I don't know if this was the book where some of them were like half angel. No, the Nephilim dude. Yes, yeah, shadow hunters, also known as Nephilim, are a secret race of beings who are humans born with angelic blood. They are the appointed warriors on earth of the angel Razio. They are appointed specifically to control and preside over the shadow world, as well as over the demons and downworlders who inhabit it. Now, that is what I remember. The shadow world, like demons would come into our realm and uh, be disguised as humans. And then the shadow hunters would have to go in and like kill them. But only people who could see the demons could see the shadow hunters. And so Clary fucking Lily James. Oh, shut up. Oh, she just pisses me off. Emily in Paris gets to kiss and suck on Jamie Campbell Bauer, and I don't, dude. She got to kiss and suck and lick on him for a little bit, and I didn't. I'm, it's just like... T- the Whatever. I don't even care. I'm not even like mad about it at all. I don't even actually care that much. Lily James gets to kiss everyone. Wait. Not Lily James, Lily Collins. Lily James, I'm so sorry, sweetie. Lily James plays Pamela Anderson. I take everything back. Lily Collins is who I'm talking about. Dude, she got to kiss and lick and suck on Jamie Campbell Bauer. That is my husband. That is my baby's father. And did I say that about Basil Bloom on the last episode? Yes, I did. Whatever. I can have more than one baby father. I can have more than one baby. Anyway, he plays the lead in this movie and he is so say what you want okay oh my god oh my god oh my god oh wow i forgot he's just striking i love a bug-eyed man maybe because i'm a bug-eyed woman this book was fantastical and magical and i remember in this scene there's one scene where they're in this beautiful greenhouse and uh emily in paris takes him on a date there for his birthday she's like it's your birthday we're gonna celebrate and he's like no one's ever done anything like this for my birthday before oh my god oh my god these are like high quality fucking photos there's this scene where there's this little circular staircase in this greenhouse for some reason and it's also they're like in new york city or something i don't know but it's this glass greenhouse on the top of a building and she like makes some dinner and all this whatever and it's such a romantic night and then they're on the stairs right here and they're about to kiss and this like Demi Lovato song (laughs) starts playing (laughs) and I remember being 13 being like that just took me out of it like I was so into it and then I heard Demi Lovato and I was like that's freaking Demi Lovato (laughs) okay Demi what the fuck are you doing here took me out of it completely and then this scene happens where he pushes her up against the door and like kind of tucks her hair behind her ear and like kind of pushes her into the wall and it's so hot and he's so much taller than her and she's just really tiny and it's like so cute and I'm fucking freak out and I'm fucking freak out and his hair is the perfect length oh I can't think about that I have to watch this movie tonight even though this is how they had him dressing dude this hooded t-shirt cut off zip up jacket let's be so for real jamie campbell bauer talks bulking up for mortal instruments he's a twink that is a twinky straight man is he straight is jamie campbell bauer married dating joseph quinn girlfriend is jamie campbell bauer in a relationship jess maloney who is jess maloney oh we're about to get to the bottom of this y'all are about to see me do a full-on deep dive here we go. Here's the Instagram. What does she do? Ooh, this is so fun. What does she do? Okay. Oh, is she a photographer? What does she do? It doesn't say. Her bio doesn't say. Her bio is just simply an ice cube. Okay. Cryptic. 
Okay, tagged photos. Oh my God. Okay, so they they've been dating for a long, oh he's so, they've been dating for a long time. Oh, so they're both tatted from head to toe and they're both sexy. Oh, so I'm humiliated and devastated. This same thing happened with Cameron Keesing a few episodes back. Cameron Keesing from All Star Weekend. Oh, I'm just pissed off. I really, I really thought that like he was about to be single. Okay, anyway, Mortal Instruments was a great, great book. And it was a whole series, and there was like a crazy plot twist at the end of book one that was like, ew, what? And then they fix it, whatever. I really, really enjoyed that book, and I kind of want to read it again as an adult to be like, was I just horny and 14, or was it actually good? That book is one that has like, who did this to you? Like, them taking care of each other. Like, Jace, no! Like, he got hurt. She has to clean his wounds. Like, that shit. And then it's, like, candlelight. And then they lean in close. And he's like, ah, because she leaned on his arm or whatever. <laughs> it's like that. And it's so good. This episode of the Broski Report is sponsored by Tinder. Guys, uncuffing season is here. How many times do I have to scream it at you? It's summer. It's the best time to be single, to have fun, and make some unforgettable memories. And Tinder is here to help you find the perfect partner for those moments. It starts with a swipe. There are so many possibilities that are just a match away. And Tinder is the world's most popular dating app. That means the most opportunity to find whatever it is you're looking for. And Tinder just released Relationship Goals, which is a new status for your profile that shows others what type of connections you're really looking for. Relationship Goals is just one of many features that Tinder has released to make sure that you're comfy on the app. Tinder has more safety features than any other app. And success on Tinder can mean whatever you want it to. 1.5 million Tinder users go on an in real life date every week. Listen, other apps are hard. Tinder is easy and fun. So on Tinder, it starts with a swipe. Download Tinder today and explore all of the possibilities for yourself. Okay, next. That was sort of like the only fantasy book I really read. Well, that's a lie. I read City of Embers as well, which was this crazy dystopian, like, afterworld uh, uh, fiction that was kind of weird. Me and my mom read it. And I remember I was like, there's no romance in this. I don't give a fuck. But there was. But they were also like kids. And I was like, I don't, I don't care in high school and I wish my bestie Taylor was sitting right here behind beside me to attest to this because I put her through the goddamn ringer and back with this bullshit that I'm about to tell you there is an author named Dan Brown I was obsessed with every piece of work he had ever written by the ripe age of 15 he wrote The Da Vinci Code if you've ever heard about this or seen this movie with Tom Hanks The Da Vinci Code is a very famous book uh, cr critically acclaimed, you know, like everyone had it on their shelf or on their fucking coffee table. And then he also wrote this book called Angels and Demons. Well, what I liked about these, because when it's not romance for me, when it's not romance and pining and who did this to you and there's only one bed, we have to share it. When it's not that, it's academic mystery. Those are the two <laughs> sort of uh, uh, categories scattergories of books that I like to put my books in. One is romance and pining and sex and sucking and licking. And then the other one is academic mystery. Dan Brown really ignited that passion for me. I was, I think I borrowed, I borrowed Angels and Demons from my uncle he had this book at his house and I was like this looks like tea because I was in this Nephilim phase I was reading a lot about fallen angels and all these because it was romance books and I was like hmm, angels and demons this looks fun and I started reading it and I was like this boring what is this and then I sort of dove head first into it and I was like oh my god I really really enjoyed it and so angels and demons is about it follows the same characters in the da vinci code which I'm about to give you a full full rundown because you guys have to read these books so let me kind of pique your interest the main character's name is robert langdon and in the movies he's played by tom hanks he's a very tom hanks-esque character younger like late 30s early 40s tom tom hanks and in the da vinci code no no, no i'll start with angels and demons in angels and demons there is a killer 
on the loose, who's doing like religious or Catholic inspired murders of priests, if I remember correctly. And it's Robert Langdon who has to go on this sort of goose chase, wild goose chase of finding this guy. And it's the secret society always. And, and Dan Brown bases it on kind of real things like the occult and real cults and religious iconography and religious tradition and all these. But so it's, it's got a hint of fiction, but it's kind of mainly based on religious practices and how fucking weird some of the Catholic stuff is. No offense. (laughs) And how weird some of the like, you know, I guess Southern Christian stuff can be too. Just how, when you look at religious tradition from an outside perspective, it's like, what the fuck? So, there is a one scene in this movie that traumatized me as a child. There's two. All of the deaths of these priests have to do with the elements for some reason. This killer was trying to send a message and make it fucking poetic and artistic, whatever. One of the priests, Robert Langdon doesn't get to him in time to save him. And he is burned alive in a cathedral. I think like in Rome or something like that. From the feet up, like burned alive. And they show him dying. And it traumatized me as a child. And there was a second one where this priest died by earth, quote unquote. And they find him too late as well. Where it's this wild goose chase through the Vatican or through Rome or through wherever. And they're in this cathedral. And then they get down to the catacombs and the archives or whatever. And they're under the church. And they open this trap door. And there is a single beam of light that is on this priest who has been trigger warning, I guess, gore, impaled, and his head has been, like, crooked back, and his mouth is shoved open, and dirt has been shoved, like, in his throat, and up his nose, and his ears, and his eyes, and it's just like, oh my god, and his skin is that, you know, like, pale blue tone, it was so traumatizing, and I'm sure if I watched it today, I'd be like, ew, that's gross, but it's not, like, that hard to look at. But as a child, dude, it was that scene. And then another scene that traumatized me as a child is, I forget which Harry Potter it is, but there's a scene where Harry comes across a Dementor in the forest feeding on a unicorn, like had killed a unicorn and was feeding on its blood. And he's like bent over it. And then he turns around to look at Harry. That shit traumatized me. Because how could you kill a freaking unicorn? (laughs) Why would you ever do that? That's literally just a unicorn. He, what'd he do? He was, he's got silver blood. Why would you kill him? I, I was like seven or eight. And I was like, oh, why would you do that? I just sleep with all the lights on. I thought the Dementors were coming for me, bitch. Okay, anyway. So that was kind of Angels and Demons. And I'm not going to ruin the end of the book if you want to read it. But uh, it's, it's very, 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 very good. Now, Da Vinci Code is kind of a similar tone it's a very like religious undertone, art history undertone. This is honestly, I can pinpoint these books sparking my interest in art history because so much of religious history has to do with, because think about it in the early, early ages, like 1100s, 1200s, wherever, up until probably 1700s when literacy became common, the average townsperson could not read that's also why um a lot of pubs and bars in like ireland england scotland wherever uh it's called like the fox and the hound or the the rabbits whatever the rabbit and the da 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 is because they would have the image of the bar name on there because people couldn't fucking read so now today, obviously, it's typed out in English and the signs are in English. But that's why that's a fun little piece of uh, uh, Anglican lore, if you care. And uh, so anyway, the average person couldn't read. So they would teach the teachings of the Bible and the stories of the Bible through uh, stained glass and through art in the Bible and through murals and through frescoes and through these sort of things where you can follow it and and have someone explain, you know, through the sermon or through wherever, what the story is on the mural. and, and, And that's how people would learn. So these things are associated with, you know, sort of indoctrination, if that's what you want to call religion. Everyone, y'all know my thing on religion. Like, 
it is a cult. I don't care what it is. It's indoctrination. Uh, specifically, you know, Judeo-Christian uh, religions. But that is sort of, yeah, what sparked my interest in art history. So the Da Vinci Code is about the Holy Grail being real. The Holy Grail being the cup Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. And they are trying to find it. And someone knows where it is. And there are multiple parties searching for it at the same time. Kind of like, kind of Indiana Jonesy, but a little different. But this book is also based on this theory that come to find out is kind of baseless and not real, but it's fun to think about. And you never know. It's based on this theory that Jesus Christ was married to Mary Magdalene. And not only were they married, she bore children with Jesus. He fathered children, so therefore there is a bloodline of Christ's offspring. And the story follows someone who is the proposed, you know, child of God. And uh, so there, this character is revealed to be a descendant. And there's a secret society that has protected her identity to keep her safe for, like, since she's been born. And everyone before that. And uh, this theory is called the Jesus Bloodline, if you want to Google it, by the way. Very interesting read. Probably baseless. Absolutely zero evidence. But then that could be argued for mm, all of Christianity as well. So this book also introduced me to the Fibonacci sequence, which is like... <laughs> This is like <laughs> nerd shit. Like nerd. Four eyes, four eyes. Like me to myself saying that. In high school, dude, I was taking a European history class. Or sorry, world history. I was taking geography and I was taking Spanish. Which in Spanish, they teach you Latin to understand more of Spanish and romance languages in general. And... I would hang after class to pester my teachers who this was in Wichita Falls, Texas. Like they're not, babe, they're not Robert Langdon. Like they're just not Robert Langdon was a college professor. Also is not a real person. I would stay after class and pester my history teachers to like answer questions I had about religion or about the church or just about the world in general. Cause I was 14, like I was 15 and I know that they probably thought it was cute at first. And then when I was like, okay, can you explain to me again how the Fibonacci sequence is in The Last Supper, how it correlates? They'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I'd be like, yeah, you're right. Sorry. So the Fibonacci sequence, this is nerd shit, dude. I used to draw this in my journal. I used to like, <laughs> I wish Taylor was here because she would have so much to say. And I had kept a journal where in class when I would get bored or if I had like studied ahead, because I was a scholar in high school. I was a scholar. It was my personality. I was a theater kid and I was a scholar, period. And I was funny, I guess, because the boys were not looking, okay? I was uh, not pulling boyfriends. I was not pulling any romance. So you have to make up for another places. And I'm so fucking glad I did. But I was a weirdo, okay? I was, I was nerd loser loser I had a journal that when I got bored in class in this book there is a <laughs> secret code that one of the people one of the people writes in this secret code and it's like a cipher it's like little symbols and each symbol represents a letter and it's based on this sort of tic-tac-toe looking thing and the dots correlate to different letters and numbers and all this shit. And I used to write notes to Taylor in class in this fucking code. And I would pass to her and I'd be like, it's a secret. Like you have to decrypt it. And she'd be like, what the fuck? I'm trying, it's biology. I'm trying to take notes. We have a test tomorrow. And I'd be like, oh. and I'd bring it back and I'd like decrypt it myself. And I'd be like, that's what I was trying to say. She'd be like, great. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Just write it to me in English next time. <laughs> it was my special interest. It was my secret passion, dude. So I used to do that. And then also there's Da Vinci used to write left-handed and backwards. So people couldn't like inter only he could read his notes and understand what he was saying. So left-handed backwards and in cursive, he would take notes. And so people were like, what the fuck are these etchings? And it was just his notes. It was, it was whatever. And so I was like, I could do that. <laughs> and I would do that too. <laughs> oh, I was so fucking weird, dude. Then 
uh, the Fibonacci sequence. Let me sequence. Let me go back to this. So this is the Fibonacci sequence. It's called the golden ratio. It's also known as the golden section, golden mean, or divine proportion in mathematics. It is also represented by a Greek letter, and this just has significance because this shape appears so much in nature in so many ways that you wouldn't expect. It also is the perfect mathematical, I mean, this sort of thing. It's like squares or something like that. I don't, I, hey, don't ask me. But I know its significance from The Last Supper. There's a correlation in The Last Supper with the Fibonacci sequence. Guys, do you give a fuck? <laughs> Hey guys, let's do a pulse check. Do y'all give a fuck? What actually am I talking about, by the way? Just doing a little little check-in with, with the team here. If you don't give a fuck, say I. And if you just said I, you're going to prison. Because this is the learning hour. This is the learning time and everyone needs to get up. How is the golden ratio used in the last supper? It is believed that Leonardo da Vinci used the golden ratio in the proportions of the table, the placement of the figures, and the overall composition of the painting. Um, now, what does this have to do with anything? You'll have to read the book and find out. Because it all comes together in a way at the end that's like, what the fuck? I was 15, like, oh my god, oh my god. The da Vinci card, oh my god, oh my god, darn burn. Ermagerd da Vinci. <laughs> sometimes I am my number one fan, and sometimes I think that I should have all my teeth ripped out and t tongue cut out, and just you're done. You're you're absolutely done. I'm silencing myself. You're done. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by PBS Debt. Here's a quick live update from Los Angeles, California. Gas is now $7 a gallon. Seven. I paid $7 a gallon when I filled up yesterday. Life is so expensive. And with rising interest rates and the cost of living at an all-time high, now is the time to finally take initiative with your debt. Stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt savings options from PBS Debt. If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances are not going down, this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies, and there's no minimum credit score required, bad and fair credit accepted. Save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. PDS Debt is offering free debt analysis to my listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash report. That's p-d-s-d-e-b-t dot com slash report. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash report. So anyway, I thought I was a political cryptographer as a 14-year-old. That's really all that you need to know about me. This also kind of segues into, you know, this sort of academic mystery. If you're not really into the sort of religious aspect of academic mystery, like he is an academic through and through because he's a professor of art history and also, you know, iconography and, and, and symbols and things like that. But if you're not into that, if that's not your cup of tea, a while back, if Broski Nation remembers, I read The Secret History and so many of y'all were like, we love Donna Tartt, but it's kind of hard to get into Donna Tartt, who's the author, if you're not uh, that kind of reader. Like, if, if that thing doesn't really interest you, which is, it's very um, big words. And the plot is very interesting because the narrator is an unreliable narrator. And I think that's what makes the book so good. Because it adds this texture to the plot and to the narrative and to how things unravel that you slowly realize Richard, the narrator cannot be trusted. Like you, he loses credibility a little bit and it's interesting. Cause it's like, Oh my God, you're telling me this fucking story, bitch. I think that my thing with the academic mystery is that I like to feel like I'm learning from fiction because I'm too impatient to read a nonfiction. And that may be problematic <laughs> because I, I did some, like as a 14 year old after I read angels and demons and da Vinci code, I was like, I wonder how much of this is actually true. And come to find out 
these books are very heavily debated by both the art community, the religious community, the Catholic church, like everyone, this was a big, it made waves when this book came out, which I think was in like 2003, 2004. And uh, people had a lot to say about it because obviously academics are going to take a book like the Da Vinci Code and absolutely rip it to shreds because it's written to entertain. It's a, it's an enthralling story with a cool main character, a little bit of romance, but mainly it's like action filled and, and it's shocking and it's, uh, got that religious undertone that kind of pulls you in the same way that I feel like, uh, exorcist movies pull you in because it's got that religious undertone and it, it's framed in this way where, only this can only happen through uh the church or someone affiliated with the church or a priest has to come in or you know uh, to an exorcist from the church has to come in and fix it's just like i think i think it's morbid curiosity that's tied to a lot of this somehow having to deal with the church because it's so old and powerful and secretive so much of religion is secretive. And I think that really struck a chord with me because I was actively growing up in the church as I was reading this. And I was like, damn, I've never thought about thinking of religion critically like this in a way. Like that wasn't really some, a concept I was familiar with. And it was easier to do that with a religion that was not mine. I am not a Catholic. I have never been a Catholic. But I grew up knowing Catholics or, you know, kids whose parents were Catholic and hearing about some of the stuff they had to do. I was like, that's fucking weird. And then some people who were not non-denominational Christian or Southern Baptist Christian were like, that's fucking weird when I would say what we would do. So it's like, you know, to each their own. But that really struck a chord with me as a child of like, what is this flavor? (laughs) What is this flavor of novel, of pastime, if you will? So yeah, this book was kind of torn apart by critics because it lacked evidential bases for uh, a a true compelling story. I don't give a fuck, bitch. It was a fun read and it's my favorite book to this day. I love Angels and Demons. It's a great book. Um, Or, well, I think Secret History might be my favorite book ever. It Recently, it it took over. I read Secret History late last year and it changed my life, dude. Like, I just enjoy the secret history so much the character building is so incredible donna tart is a wizard with with her words and with building a compel i mean she tells you what happens on the first page it's a murder mystery and someone dies on the first page period and the rest of the book tells the story of how it happened and how these characters just unravel and why it happened and it's fucked bitch it's fucked and it's tea and they're all sucking and fucking each other but it's not in a way that's like oh quarter thorns and roses it's like ugh, it's like kind of gross anyway secret history is about a small group of friends academics who are accepted into this small inner circle of uh students who study greek and not only the greek language but greek uh epics right isn't a greek epic greek epic I am so smart. The Greek epic may have been strongly influenced by these Asian traditions. Tea. We're all connected as humans. Eastern influences. The Greek world in the late Bronze Age was related to the Middle East by so many close ties that it formed an integral part of the Levant. What is that? I'm bored. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's they study Greek epics and like famous Greek tales and you know whatever and and uh one of the characters gets inspired by an old tale or an old myth and tries to do it himself and the rest of the book the book you'll have to read because it's so good i had to read it i I like shit like that though you know like i had to read it and i had my dictionary app open like i love that i like to learn and Not to bring it back to the Barbie movie, but I will bring it back to the Barbie movie really quick because that's how my brain works. That's how my brain works. Hi. Hello. (laughs) Have y'all seen that Melania Trump clip? Is there something you have learned about your dad in the course of this campaign that you didn't? Hello. 
Melania, is there something you've learned about him that you maybe didn't know? Uh, he's strong, he's passionate, he's smart, he's tough. And uh, he's an adult, and he's smart, he's tough, he's strong, he's passionate, uh -huh. and uh, he's smart, the, he's tough. The, the perseverance, I mean, that we always knew was there. That's Hello. always been there, but I mean... Hello? <laughs> Hello? Hello? <laughs> Hello? That's how I feel. That's how I feel when I lose my train of thought. It's just her face like this. Hello? <laughs> just echoing. <laughs> Or I feel like that clip of uh, Patrick on the seahorse. This. That's what's in my brain. In my brain rattling around is this clip and hello. Hello. <laughs> hello. You know, Patrick riding a seahorse for 10 hours HD. What are the comments on this video? Patrick being aware that he's in a dream and can do whatever he wants, yet chooses to vibe on the seahorse ride is the height of the Sigma mindset. This is the only thing that's keeping me alive right now is one of the comments. <laughs> oh, I just adore the simplicity. It's a perfect example of how game developers overhype graphics when 8-bit games are just as much fun as they ever have been. <laughs> but do 8-bit games have Ghost and Koenig from Call of Duty? No, they don't. Okay, next I want to... Okay, wait. I'm not done. Okay, I think I actually am. I'm done talking about the secret history. You have to read it. Read Angels and Demons by Dan Brown. Read The Da Vinci Code. If you're into that sort of stuff. If you're into, like, fairy smut, read Court of Thorns and Roses. Okay? I really don't have any more uh, recommendations. But I will hand the mic over to y'all for any recommendations you have for me about academic mystery. I love a good academic mystery. Um, I went through a brief um, dark academia phase where Babel was recommended to me and I bought it and it's on my shelf. Haven't gotten around to it. Song of Achilles was also recommended to me. That is also on my shelf. And... I read Ninth House, but I did not like it. I think Ninth House is a Sarah J. Mass book, isn't it? Ninth House author. No, Lee Bardugo. But Lee Bardugo wrote um, that Six of Crows one, right? Which was the Shadow, Shadow and Bone. Yeah, Shadow and Bone, that TV show was so good. But I haven't read the books. Anyway, Ninth House did not impress me. You can read it and, I don't know, tell me what you thought. But if you have any recommendation, recommendations for me about academic mystery, definitely drop them in the comments. I will be reading them. This episode of The Brosky Report is sponsored by ZuckDuck. I know for some of you, you're freshly coming into real adulthood where the idea of making your own doctor's appointment could just about send you into a coma. But fear not. We've all been there. There is hope. And I have a hack for you. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top-rated patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat almost any condition you're searching for. These docs all have verified reviews from actual, real patients, not bots. The average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between 24 to 48 hours. That's it. You can even score same-day appointments. Once you find the doctor you want, you can book them immediately with just a few app taps. There's no more waiting awkwardly on hold with a receptionist. And I use ZocDoc to find my dermatologist out here in LA. And he slays and I'm mole-free, so that's a win-win. Go to ZocDoc.com slash broski and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash broski. ZocDoc.com slash broski. Next, to completely switch gears, we have to talk about DJ Khaled. We have to talk about DJ Khaled. God did. Khaled, what's that on your red? I call her chandelier. Oh, what? <laughs> he, the way y'all comment on my shit of like, she makes me so comfortable being myself. That's how I feel about DJ Khaled. I watch DJ Khaled and I'm like, you could be anything. 
You could be anything. I call her chandelier. <laughs> This is called what? <laughs> Have you ever played rugby? Life. There's Roblox. Let's go golfing. <laughs> Let's go golfing. Let's go. I told him bring out the whole ocean. Bring out the cappuccino. This is uh, okay. Add this to the roster of what's going on in my brain at all times. Hello, Melania Trump. Patrick riding the seahorse and DJ Khaled. I told him bring out the whole ocean. A collar chandelier. Let's go golfing. Call me asparagus. <laughs> I love that one. Call me asparagus. <laughs> what the fuck are you saying? What are you saying? <laughs> Call me asparagus. He is so funny. I, I wish I could be half as funny as fucking DJ Khaled not even trying. Let's go to the beach. <laughs> Let's go swimming. <laughs> Let's go golfing. <laughs> Tell them to bring the yacht out. Roses are red. <laughs> Violets are blue. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Follow me. Ladies, I'm taking. <laughs> Follow me. Like, what? The step is so funny. Tell him to bring out the lobster. Tell him to bring out the lobster. Yes, sir. Tell him to bring out the All lobster. Right. Look at these babies. He's so. Tell him to bring out the lobster. <laughs> what do you call this? That's avocado toast. Or what do you call this? That's sausage. <laughs> Tell him to bring out the lobster. We have got to get DJ Khaled on Royal Court. Holy shit. We have got to get DJ Khaled on Royal Court. I told him bring out the lobster. Let's go golfing. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> Why is he this way? Why does he do that? I have got to get him on Royal Court, dude. We have to review some of the best DJ Khaled dancing memes. When it's 4 a.m. and your dad is brushing his teeth and you hear this banger come on. <laughs> <laughs> the first. Oh. <laughs> Me at McDonald's, but this banger comes on. When my mom is about to take a left and this banger comes on. <laughs> I have got to sit down and have a conversation with DJ Khaled. Like just to have one moment with DJ Khaled, a real moment. A moment, a, law, a dream, a laugh, a moment. I want a moment on with DJ Khaled. We have got to get him on Royal Court. I am not joking, dude. Do you think he'd do it? He did hot ones. He did hot ones. A moment of love. God, there is not a better song than that. A moment of love. A kiss. A cry. What are the lyrics? A moment of love. A dream. A loud. A moment of love. You know what also is a great song that that uh, I always get confused with this one is um, and it's a bit of sweet symphony this life. Damn. Oh, my God. I was hanging out with Madison Beer the other day because <laughs> she's my soul sister. I fucking love we're the same person. And it freaks me out. And we look like twins, too. Stop. You can say, no, you can say it. It's fine. I was hanging out with Madison and we were talking about fun, the band. Fun? He doesn't have any allegations or anything, does he? You never fucking know these days. Fun, the band, lead singer. I had the fattest crush on him. Nate Roos. Nate Roos. Allegations. <laughs> What happened? 
we are young did not age well what happened however there's something that has always made me feel deeply uncomfortable about how the song makes me feel i simultaneously feel myself being pulled in by its convicted urgent optimism while also acknowledging the story that drives the song isn't one that deserves this idealism okay fucking shakespeare relax it's a song just look at the lyrics while the song is admittedly inspired by a moment in Nate Roos's life that he isn't proud of, hence the let's do better as a generation vibe, it couches that humanizing self-criticism within the story of a person who seems to be just straight up physically abusive, which is not at all what Nate's inspiration for the song was. What are you talking about? The song begins with the line, give me a second eye, I need to get my story straight. It's unclear whether this phrase is directed. At the okay, so no, he didn't do anything. She's just like doing a full in-depth analysis of the fucking lyrics. Whatever. Fun band. Oh, do some nights I stay up cashing in my bad luck. Some nights I... Holy shit. I'm about to re-enter my fun era. What was that album called? Aim, aim, aim and ignite. Holy shit. This album is so fucking good. What do you bitches know about fun? What do you bitches know about some nights and aim and ignite? <gasps> some nights of this and violence can build it. Here we go. Some nights I wish that my lips could build a castle. And here's the harmony. Some nights I wish that my lips could build a castle. <laughs> and here's the beatbox. I could be pentatonics like you're done. Pentatonics move out of the fucking way. I can do it. It's called a one woman show. It's called Yes Women Can. It's called I'm Barbie, I Can Be Anything. And guess what I am? This Barbie is Pentatonix. <laughs> this Barbie is a soprano, alto, tenor, and beatboxer. All at the same time. Okay? Did y'all ever used to do those apps in middle school or high school that was like, the acapella app where you would make your own song or you would sing a cover and do, and you would record all of them individually and you could only do like one or two or three. And then the free version was over and you had to pay for it. I was always so impressed by the people that could do that. I wanted to do that so bad. I wanted to be, I was a choir kid. Of course I was a choir kid because I was a theater kid, but I wanted to be like pentatonix level so bad and no one would do it with me. Like, my friends were like, that's not cool. And I was like, whatever. And also, acapella kids are not cool, traditionally, in high school. Like, if you do acapella successfully and beautifully arranged outside of school, it slays. And people love it. They live for it. Because acapella is impressive. But if you're just, like, trying to pitch perfect yourself in high school, babe, it's not going to happen. Lose her. But that was me. I wanted to be in a acapella group so bad. Tonight, we are young. Oh, my God. When you're lost and alone, and, 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 and all alone, carry on. Carry on, carry on. I have to go to karaoke right now. I'm actually going to wrap up this episode in like five minutes and go to my room and sing Carry On by Fun Karaoke in my room. Oh my God, this album was so good. Were y'all into, first of all, Fleet Foxes. I love Fleet Foxes in high school. I was such a Fleet Foxes girl because that was simultaneously, I discovered Fleet Foxes and the Avid brother, Avid brothers and the Teskey brothers in high school when I was having my bluegrass, uh, Revival, where the Oh Brother Where Art Thou soundtrack was like the number one most played album ever for me. I was really into Dolly, like newer Dolly, like Blue Smoke era Dolly. Um, that was a lot of just bluegrass gospel songs. And I was having that. And then I discovered Fleet Foxes as well, which is like a beautiful blend of old bluegrass with modern indie. And 
I, in, in through all that, I also listened to this band Half Moon Run, which was so good. I loved Half Moon Run. And uh, that, like, I every time I hear one of those songs or a Young the Giant song, it takes Cough Syrup by Young the Giant. Oh, fuck off, bitch. Those, that era of music to me is so nostalgic because, yes, I listened to Arctic Monkeys, Lana Del Rey, whatever, but that was kind of the other side of it where I was having this sort of indie folk moment, which I guess a lot of people were, but like Abbott Brothers, get into it, bitch. I Bluegrass and country, folk country is coming back. Tyler Childers, Coulter Wall, like there's Zach Bryan even, like there are a lot of people who are bringing this lost art form back. And so much of country music before, honestly, 9-11 was anti-establishment and like Johnny Cash was so anti-fucking government and anti like it was such a, a progressive and after 9-11 country music there was like a big shift for some reason and I mean I, I understand the reason like patriotism of course but it just went too far almost where it's like every fucking song now in country music is about red white and blue and fucking your truck and I don't do that in a small town can we be so serious for a second? Can we be so serious? That's the type of music that appeals to like, it's not thoughtful in its art form. It is a quickly pumped out, like pump and dump country pop radio banger. Banger, I say in quotes. That they pump out of just like, I love my truck, dirt roads, dirt on my boots, da da da, whatever. And they're catchy songs, like John Party songs are catchy, whatever. But I'm not listening to that and I'm like, damn, I love country music. You know, it's so meant for the masses that I find it hard to relate to that type of music, even though it has the label country music. Country music to me is like old Alan Jackson or like Randy Travis. Or even, you know, I the 90s country of George Strait, Garth Brooks, all that. Like, I like it, but I really tend to lean more bluegrass when I listen to country music, quote unquote. And it's crazy the difference in lyricism. So I could write a whole dissertation on that, on, on how country music was forever changed by the events of the early 2000s in America. So... I think that'll just about do it for me, team, because I need to go to my room, got to get back on my iPhone, read some more ghosts from Call of Duty fan fiction, and got to go sing karaoke, okay? Now it is 1.47 a.m., and I don't give a fuck, and also maybe my camera broke, but now I'm stressed out, but it's fine, because guess what? It's an audio podcast, and we adapt and overcome, team. I love you guys. Thank you for listening. Please go subscribe to the YouTube channel, Brady Broski. Go watch Royal Court, my show, when we have DJ Khaled on the show. <laughs> We're working on it, team. I'm, I've got to get DJ Khaled on Royal Court. But, like, my life depends on it. Then go follow me on Instagram. Follow me on TikTok. That's how it feels. And be sure to keep up with me on but for real, give it a like and a follow and a five-star rating. Love you guys so much. Mm, bye, bye.